Continuous improvement comes in lots of different flavors and styles. I'm Bella Engelbach, and I'm inviting you to journey with me to the edges of lean. Episode 96, Continuous Improvement and the Japanese Abacus. Mawaka Abacus has taken the honorific sensei, teacher. She is not a lean sensei, but she's a beloved teacher of the Japanese Abacus. She's here to tell us what we can learn about Japanese culture by developing the practices of learning from failure, having discipline, and encouraging clear analytical thinking using the ancient Japanese practice of doing math on the abacus. Sensei Miwaka, welcome to the Edges of Lean. Thank you, Vera. Thank you for having me. Sensei Miwaka, could you tell us about yourself? What is it that you do? And what was your path to doing what you do today? Yes. Uh, my name is Miwako Sakabayashi. Yes, I am Japanese, but my student called me Sensei Miwako. So that's why I am you know, known to be Sensei Miwako. So I'm from Japan and I came to uh, America in 1992 and then started JAMS in January 2001, which is almost 23 years ago. And then since then I have been teaching Japanese abacus. So JAMS is the one my school name. JAMS is designed to teach students the Japanese abacus, which is something I learned when I grew up in Japan. And then now I have a project of teaching a student who may be struggling in math or sometimes uh, who wanted to be excel, excel their math. And then sometimes another reason. And then myself, I never, I loved abacus since I was, you know, uh, I was a child. But at the same time, I was dreamed about teaching abacus when I was in Japan. But when, after I came to US, which is 1992, that dream was gone, really gone. I think that my big obstacle was English language. But somehow I came out this path and then now I have been really teaching Japanese abacus, but my passion is teaching, not only teaching Japanese abacus, I wanted to teaching them the culture of the Japan, what I was brought up. And then I think that was most important for me, not only teaching Japanese abacus, but I really wanted to teach the children for the core of the culture of the Japan. Wow. So you, when you came to the U.S., you didn't speak um, much English or any any English at all. So you had to learn a new language. Um, yes. And I also, you had not run a business in the U.S. before either. So so you 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 became a business person um, teaching the Japanese abacus. So you must have learned a lot along the way as as you went through all of that. I believe so. But many people say that, including you, but myself, I always just only looking forward and looking forward, looking forward. And then sometimes I look back, especially when I am struggle. And then I said to myself, wow, I came this much. Yeah. Okay. Then let's keep going. It's uh -huh. never stopped me. So, yeah. That learning English was most hardest things to me besides that the learning and the culture. But the luckily, I have a three children. Those children, and also my student, I learned the English and I learned the culture. I learned the social, you know, so, you know, society from my children and from my student. I am lucky. <laughs> Kids are great for that, aren't they? And, and I, I bet you, I, I bet you, you get not just English, but you get the most current slang as well from the students. Yes, I got it. And then sometimes, what does it mean? I said, well, like, you know, like uh, so many interesting words I never even hear or heard or anything in the, my textbook in Japan. I learned the English, basic the English, but Japan is a country teaching English only reading and writing. 
So mm. my ears were not trained. So back in the story, 1992, when I landed in here, April 17, 1992, I still remember vividly. The only things I remember was the price of the fried potato. <laughs> the people asked me something, but I just said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Thank you. And I left. That was a Portland airport. <laughs> I remember that. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Mawako, can you tell us what the Jap Japanese abacus is? I'm, I'm familiar with abacus only as something that I was shown in elementary school, that, you know, this was a way that in some other cultures that math was learned and, and that people used it for, for mathematics. But, but can you explain it? Obviously, uh, we can't see it right now, but can you tell us what the abacus is? And more importantly, what do you learn when you use the abacus? How does your brain learn to process? So the Japanese abacus is, this is that reaction I got it from many people when I said, what do you teach? I said, yes, I'm teaching Japanese abacus. Abacus? Is that the, a lot of bees just sliding right and left? I said, uh, it's not the right and left. It's that vertical, you know, not, you know, horizontal. Or vertical, vertical. I said, oh, okay. But that is uh, ancient. <laughs> it mm. is ancient. It is almost a 2000, back in uh, almost nearly 3000 years from the, you know, Egypt. And then came to all the way to the Silk Road that came to the Japan almost nearly 1000 years ago. And then we, most of the, right now, the all around the world using the Japanese abacus, which is one top bees, four bottom bees. And then the, it's very the different size of the abacus. But what we are teaching is more, it's very visible and then tactile. Whatever it shows on the bees is already representing the number, like an alphabet. So once you understand the, how to read the abacus, that is the beginning. And then next thing is, is as you know, math is calculation. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, and the division. Four elements of the calculation can be done by abacus. So multiplication is repeated addition. Division is a repeated subtraction. So if you, if you learn how to add and subtract by using the abacus, you can do everything, almost nearly everything what you can do in the calculator. The only difference is Big difference is abacus, once you uh, learned and mastered, you do not need an abacus. Calculator, you constantly need it to calculate whenever you need to calculate. That is a big pro and a con, but also calculator do not have to learn how to use it. Abacus has to learn how to use the abacus to calculate. But once you, like I said to you, once you learned how to calculate, it will be into you rest of your life. No one cannot take it off. To me, this is a second language of the numbers. It's like a math, it's like a, the math language. Yes. That, yes. So that's I, so I'll tell you a, a, a story about about myself. I remember when I was probably eight. And we were working on multiplication tables in school. And I remember being very angry. <laughs> That's, this is me, that I had to learn multiplication tables. And I kept thinking to myself, if I just understood how it worked, the sort of the machinery inside the multiplication table, I wouldn't have to memorize it. But of course, no one taught me the, how it worked inside. All they taught me was, here's your multiplication table and you have to memorize it, which is which was um, horribly boring. And I think that if someone had given me a Japanese abacus at that time, I would have been thrilled because I would have been able to learn, I think. How, how did it actually work? As you said, multiplication is really addition. So um, that is um, a missed opportunity, I think. I, I believe so. I have taught many uh, upper level with the children. In fact, right now, I'm te uh, volunteering teaching at the high school student who are mainly a little bit behind. But those children, first of all, it's not the math. 
they lost the confidence. They lost mm. the confidence. That's why they became hate. They are not the hate from the beginning. No one hates anything, right? But the, because of the, you know, like a lines of the, you know, like a piles of the failure and the, you know, like all the, you know, agony and everything, that making them hate. That's the protecting them, their own feeling. But when I go there, I've started to teaching them that, like I told you earlier, the good thing is about avocados when they see, they can feel it, they can touch it, and then they can calculate it. It's not the writing down the numbers and we, you have to, you know, imagine and visualize it. It's very tactile. So then after they done, very simple calculation, but then they are always asking me, is that the answer seven? It's very doubtful telling me, asking me, is that the nine? Yeah, nine. Wow. That's the reaction coming from the student, which is 15, Aww. 16, 17. That made me like a goosebumps. I said, oh, my God, I did it. So that <laughs> making them to, I can do it. As you know, once we feel it, I can do it. And then what happened next? They would have started to stood up and then they're going to do it themselves. That is the most important part of the, you know, like a teaching of the children. We are not making them to like it. We making them, giving them the path to guiding them. You can do it. And then once they see it, they said, wow, I can do it. And then what happened next? They wanted to try again and they wanted to feel those. This is a good, like, you know, like a positive, you know, reaction instead of, oh, I cannot do this. Oh, I hate this. Oh, I don't want to do this. You know, it's so, so hard. It's, it's I so hard. It. So I, yeah. And I tried it. I tried and I failed and I tried and I failed and then I got in trouble and I got a bad grade. So why bother? Right. right? That's a, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. So the people who are listening to this podcast, obviously, um, many of them are parents and, and have have children, but we are all also working with adults. And a lot of times in lean and continuous improvement, we rely on data, we rely on numbers and the ability to use numbers effectively to see and understand what's really happening. If we, you know, the, if we're going to make an improvement, run that as an experiment, we're going to collect some data on did it work or did it not work? What did we learn from it? And um, I think a lot of people who are in the workplace are um, in the same position of, as your high school students, that they are um, to feel defeated by the math or, or need to you know, have to rely on, on their calculator or, or their laptop to help them do the math or they, they can't see, so see how the data actually works um so does what you do how you teach it does this help adults as well definitely definitely yeah. you know in fact i can tell when you see the the children who completely master the it's called we call the anza maybe english translation is like a mental calculation sounds a little bit odd but what is a mental calculation means that we are not using the actual bees, but we already learned those movement. And then just with that, some people said the air abacus, because we don't have anything. We cannot have actual bees, but we already know the movement. And then that movement coming into our head. And then the moment we look at the number and the second we get the answer. So, Maybe I can explain to you a little bit of the detail when the children started learning and then they started, you know, showing their skill at the school and then school giving them the, you know, sheet of the calculation and the kids just writing down the numbers like a four, eight, seven, six, nine, as if they are not even thinking. But what happened was hundreds of the questions within a minute, my student can be done and then teach us, how did you do that fast? And then the children, you know, were already, you know, like uh, asked, do you have a hiding in the calculator? Where is it? <laughs> he said, no, I don't have it. Then how did you do that? Well, my head. How? You know, so that much people cannot believe this can be done by anybody, not only the child, not because I'm Japanese. Sometimes they say, oh, Asians are good at it. No, it's not. 
In fact, I have so many American students and many different ethnicity of the students. But what, what happened is once the children learned those skills, it will be second nature. Like I do speak Japanese, I do speak English. So the moment you, I have to say Japanese, without looking at the Google Translate or checking in the dictionary or writing the anything, I can just translate it myself to telling you or telling anybody. It will be the same things happen. So you can imagine in the adult, I have been, you know, I have my graduate student already working in the industries. And then time to time I contacting them. Are you, hey, you know, how are you? And then, you know, are you still using the abacus? And then there's everybody said, sensei, definitely. That is a game changer. How you say that? Well, I don't need to even think about the curriculum. The moment the people are talking to me and then I can still moving on forward and then the back of my mind already know the answer. So like a, so many people said, like I said, we have a curriculum. Why we needed to learn this thing? Why, 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 why? But reality is no matter what kind of profession you have, even housewife or professor or doctors, attorney, engineer, math teachers, or school teachers, or even like a architect, anybody needs numbers. Even like, you mm -hmm. know, gas, pumping the gas. If you have only $20, how many, if the gas is $4.19 per gallon, how many gallons I can punch, you know, put it in? Of course, Gage telling you, but if you are smart enough, you can quickly think, oh, $4, you know, four gallons I can go at least. Maybe a little bit for there's a little bit more. Maybe another thing is, is each time, this is not only me, my student, we have a kind of like a picture memory. So the number became a bees. Okay. Number became a bees. So each time I go to the, let's say Costco is a really good example. Each time I go to the Costco, I see the $3.99. Oh, okay. And then I look at the, you know, like a value and then, oh, this will be, you know, 78 cents per, per pound or something. Oh, that's good. And then I go to the, you know, Safeway or another grocery store and then looking at this. Wow, this is way cheaper. Many people just think, believe, God believe that the Costco is everything cheap. No, it's not. Sometimes <laughs> still item in Safeway out of some of those, you know, you know, local grocery store, sometimes cheaper. Mm -hmm. But I remember those numbers in the picture. I can quickly differentiate. Because you know? you've had you've had all of those years of experience of, of seeing it visually and as you said, the tactile piece as well. So it's so your brain has so much to hold on to when it comes right. to that number. It's not it's not something abstract no. out there. It's no, it's, a, it's a feeling, it's something that you can see. Right. Yeah. But maybe another thing is to, this is only me. Maybe I don't know my student. Because of that, numbers sometimes became overwhelming. Oh. <laughs> so that's why, especially when I look at the numbers, like a good example is always gas station. I try not, I try not to look at the numbers as a number. I try to look at as a letter. So four dollars 99 or you know four, you know three dollars something i said okay and then just look go away i try not to look at it because i really try to think just the moment i switch on i started to calculating i really started to calculate in my head it's scary so <laughs> you know that much i we were very much trained yeah so sometimes i remember another thing is i remember i cannot memorize the uh, exit number of the freeway i said why i cannot memorize the freeways you know exit number and then i realized oh because of the number i try not to even look at it because once i look at it i vividly came into my head I, it cannot get rid of it so no. that is the one you know another just but if i said the better way if i try to memorize it i can just very easy to memorize anything right. My students too. Wow, wow. Sensei Mawaka, one of the things that you said that you want that you enjoy teaching is not just the abacus, and, and it sounds like there's so much va 
value in learning that and becoming really fluent in the language of numbers through learning the Japanese ab- abacus. But you also said that you like to teach the Japanese culture. So what is it in the Japanese culture that uh, you like to teach your students? The Japanese culture, several things I wanted to teach is a respect. Respect. Mm. Very important to me, respect. I always say to the children, you know, not because I'm the sensei, I'm the older than you. You have to respect me. If you want to respect to be, you should respect the others. And then you can respect yourself. And then also, I said, who knows, after 20 years, you may be, you know, working in South Africa, France, Copenhagen, you know, China, Korea. But if you deeply inside yourself has a respect to others, you will be respected, even though you do not know that culture. That's what I learned from, you know, like my, my culture. And I came here, like I told you 31 years ago, I did not speak well. But my way of the respect to others was a gesture, the buying myself to thank you. Mm. I mean, who do not like to be respected, appreciated? So that is a very deep down in myself. So because I have those, I also teach the children because the respect has to be disciplined. If you are not disciplined, I don't think respect will come along. That's what I always believe. Yeah. Yeah, so, so can you explain more about that connection between discipline and, and respect? Because I think discipline is a very, has a lot of different meanings. Right. Uh, so, so when you say discipline, what, what do you mean? So, you know, discipline means, you know, when they come, like I especially, this is a good example. Children always said, oh, say, say, I forgot, I forgot abacus. I forgot the book. And then that's happened, anybody. I'm not blaming on. But what I, I'm not really like is, oh, my mom forgot my book, in, you know, put it in my bag. Oh, my dad didn't tell me. Uh, then I said, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me. Who is it this class? Mine. Okay. Is this your mom's class? No. So who is this book? Mine. Is this your mom's book? No. So who has to put the book in? Me. Good job. Good point. <laughs> But, you know, children are very manipulative. So whatever happened at home, whatever parents telling the kids, kids already remember those sentences. And then they're just changing the subject. And, oh, my mom forgot. <laughs> no, you are not. You know, you, if this is your thing. But same time, I also teach, educate the parents too. By the way, if you want your child to be, become an independent, you have to step back, giving them the accountability, give them the responsibility. This is you investing in your child, means that you have to, you know, like a step back to give them the opportunity to be learn. If you are taking up the learning system, which is a discipline part to me, if you are not, let them do. Yes, children will fail, children will make a mistake, but that is a part of the learning. If they are not fading, then what happened later on? Eventually, they will fail somewhere else. But it's, I, I believe, I always said to the parents, you should make them fail when they are under your roof. By the time oh, eight, 17, 18, they have to go. And after right. that, my child is, you know, we living in the West Coast, Portland, Oregon, and then my son going to the Boston. Oh, my God. How he's going to eat, how he's going to wear, da, 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 da. are you really serious to worrying about that? They, he is already 18 years old. He will be fine. But if you're not well trained that you are son, you, it's your problem, right? So same thing. It's, it's as you know, teaching adults is very difficult. Teaching children is way easier. Than teaching adults. I mean... No one wanted to be changed. No one wanted to be taught unless they are willing to open the door, right? We already have a hardcore wired, hardwired head. But once 
I'm not saying, you know, teaching uh, adults is harder. Everybody is easier. Everybody is harder. But in general, parenting, guiding the parents is harder because they have the, their the guiding, own way. Than guiding the children. Uh, right. That's so interesting. And and so it's so interesting for us to think about those of us who are working with adults, right? That, right. that and we, we often say this in in lean thinking that you have to have that learner's mindset that beginner's mindset you're not going to you're not going to move forward if no. you come into something thinking, thinking you have nothing else to learn or that you're afraid to fail but then it's i think it's the teacher's job to help to make sure that the size of the failure is not enormous, right? Because we, no. do, we don't want people to feel as if they, they tried something, just like the kids yeah. who couldn't learn math. We don't right. want adults to feel like they tried something and they failed and that's the end of the world. And now they're not going to try anything ever again. Right. But right. Um, yeah, but but I, I think that's so interesting, the connection between respect and accountability or self-accountability and willingness to be open take in new learning and make mistakes, right? So so it goes back to then respect means that I respect my ability to learn and I I respect your ability to learn, but we know it's not going to be a straight path. No, but like I back to the door discipline, another thing is, is we give them a homework, even though five years old, six years old. In this country, as you all of you know, kindergartner, First grader, second grader, they even barely get the homework, you know, and then three, four, five, and then by the time, you know, like uh, elementary school age is done and then going to the middle school and then all of a sudden change the world and then constantly checking, 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 grading and everything. And then why they change it? Why they cannot do it from the beginning when they are much more easy to learn? That's what I honestly, I um, I love America. I I I I I mean, like I love everything over the America. But that part of the education system in U.S. is the one not fond of it. They should, starting from the kindergarten, they should be more disciplined. I, they should be more teaching them that accountability. What I always say. <laughs> I maybe I don't know, but I'm gonna say it. I always feel that in this country, elementary school is like a joke. Joke. I mean, like why they don't teach from the day one, kindergarten, when they are freshly, you know, cheerfully and started, you know, enjoying the life? Why they don't give them the more accountability and the more discipline, like the way how they do in the middle school? Sometimes I received a student, I, you know, my a middle school student coming to us. And then what happened when I evaluated those students, their math level is almost nearly first and second grader. Really? And then they, then they already came up to the six, seven, eight. And then parents are so worried. My son is going to the high school next, you know, in a year. I'm so worried. Yeah, of course, you should. But my question to them is why? Why this student already failed that much all the way all the way to the sixth and seventh grader? What happened? They just only check and then go and check and go and check and go. That which to me is very disrespectful. You know, I said, oh my God, what happened? But when they like the basic things, we asking the child, bring the own pencil, bring the own pencil, sharpen the own pencil. Almost 80% of the children not bringing the pencil. Why? Because really? school, school providing them sent out the desk, sharing this. I remember my children also saying every year bringing the brand new sharp, you know, unsharpened pencil, brand new colored pencil, brand new, brand new, every year. And then they share with each other. Okay. Sharing is great things. That is one of the, you know, I love the U.S. Okay, sharing. Okay, that is very true. But same time, what is a, a where is a responsibility for your own own pencil? 
And then I, you know, I asked the middle school student, hey, do you, can you tell all the, those, you know, younger student, is your classroom has a pencil box, which you can borrow or which anybody can share, no? So who, who has to bring your pencil? Me. If you don't have the pencil, what are you going to do? Well, uh, I have to look for another pencil in my backpack, or I have to ask my friends to borrow. Okay. So is that the better to prepare the, your own, you know, asset yourself? Yes. But elementary age, they don't teach those things. And so to me, it's why. Why I came up to this subject because my country, Japan, from the first grader, they have their own pencil book, own book, own backpack, everything. So they have to bring in everything by themselves, sharpen them, prepare it, and then study, and then go home, and they're coming back again. They already have a and dose. Not, yeah. I, and not only do they do that, right, but they are also responsible for, for getting themselves to school and getting themselves home again. Right. Um, and uh, I think one, yeah. one of the things that that is – uh, rampant in this country are the kids who are not able, allowed to walk to school or take a bus because, you know, for, for whatever reason. And, um, you know, so again, it's their parents' responsibility to get them right. to school. Right. But same time, is that the true? No. If the, so to me, successful is a become a how became an independent to take your own responsibility. But how you can teach that, to me, the bottom line is a respect. If you respect your own, you know, own act, you will be very, you know, accomplished on from the day one. And then you know what you, then you can re expect others to be treated that way. It's not, you know, my responsibility to changing other people's how they should respect me, no. But if I respect my own self, it should be you know coming back to them. I mean, I respect them, it will be coming back to me. That's how I always believe. That's why I'm teaching them just only bringing the pencil, doing the homework. It's your problem, not my problem not parents problem but you know some now now not really much but it used to be oh you should you know some parents said to student oh you need to do the homework otherwise since they got mad at you i said uh i don't really care <laughs> i said i don't really <laughs> have to mad at you you know why I, and then you know kids are very honest kids are like a puppet you know mm -hmm. like so when when something happened we don't have to actually, we don't have to ask the parents, hey, what's going on? Kids tells us whole story, true story. No, you know, no fiction, no fiction. It's just a fiction. You know, everything is just, you know, coming. It's no, you know, all the drama is coming to, from their mouth because they are so pure. So then, you know, oh, my mom said, if you, I don't do the homework, since they got mad at you, and I laugh at them. I said, you know, oh, yeah? Hmm. Do I really need it to mad at you? I don't know. I said, honestly, I don't think so. Because, you know, if you don't do your homework, it's your fault. I'm not going to be, really, it's nothing to do with me. You better really think, if you do right, you're coming back here, do you feel good? Yes. Okay. If you don't do the homework and coming back to class, do you feel good? No. And then your attitude became slouching and then you don't want it to looking at the other teachers and you, don't, you feel so embarrassed. You don't want it to be, you know, you know, like a long, anything. You close your door, not me. Do you understand? I'm teaching those things at a very young age. It's your responsibility. And top of it, another respect I wanted to share. Student, my students are very lucky to coming to my class. My class are not free volunteer class. Their parents pay. Their parents are willing to invest the money for the, their children. So 
children, you should know this is not free. Is any of your classmates come to my class? Do you? Do they? No. Okay. Because your parents care about you, love you so much, and they, you, they want you to be successful. They know the value, what we can teach. We'll be, you know, two grades, three grades way ahead to start. Like a compound rate, right? If they're going to do the well from the beginning, what happened 10 years later? It's obvious. So that's why your parents are investing money on you. So... What I really wanted to, by the way, have you ever thank you to your mom? I said, no. I said, okay, now it's time. When you step out, you should say, thank you, mom. Your mom Aww. loves you more. <laughs> again, simple act, but again, should it has to be taught. Right, yeah. This thing is, is very important to me. That's why that's one word. I said, respect. Easy to say respect, but a respect, appreciation, everything is just coming together to me. Mm. That's really valuable. And I think it's very valu valuable for those of us in the lean community because we talk about respect a lot. We talk about respect for people. Um, and it's, it is a very hard concept for those of us raised in the West to really mm. get our minds around. Um, and mm. so what you've been telling us and, and what you what you share with your students and what you ask them to do, I think, is is helpful to those of us who are trying to understand what that word really means. And then mm. and then to think about, well, how do we apply that in the workplace? You know, it, it's you know, it's about it's about being there. It's about being on time. It's about as a manager um, having having respect for your employees, treating them with grace and with dignity and um, making sure that they have opportunities to, to learn and to grow. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. it's easy for us to forget. I think that, you know, we get so involved in, in all sorts <laughs> of other things, but, right. but I can see how for you, it's very foundational. Well, um, maybe another thing is this is also Japan. Japan is a country, as you know, a very tiny, small country living in the millions of the people. And the housing was, you know, people are small, not like a big, like Americans, but, you know, housing, roads, cars, everything is so tiny. So it's like, a, to me, it's a people are living in like a condominium life. You know, you can hear everything on the side, you know, like a neighbor's. You don't, you don't have to do this, you know, like you're putting on, a, you know, listening in the neighbor's wall. But we, and then also like, a, you know, trains, especially big cities like a Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Nagoya, so many people. If you don't respect other people's space, it will be chaos. It just a chaos. People line it up very easily because my mind, I always believe if you do not want, if you want to be treated the way how you want it, you should treat yourself. But at the same time, you should respect others before you think about yourself. That was like a from my mind, it was already ingrained constantly since I was born. And that's how I was raised. So that's why all of a sudden I came here and then I said, Oh, it's okay. Oh, I don't care. I said, mm, Really? But, you know, it is okay. It's a vague part. It's a very, you know, nice part of this country, too, because the country is so big. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about just one millimeter, one cent. I get it. But it's not the size of the care or not. It's just a matter of how much you show your care to others. That is coming back to you. Like a watching, looking at yourself, the mirror. If you spit it on mirror, what happened? Your face will be spit it on, right? Mm. But again, if you spit it on the you know field, nothing coming back to you because you right. didn't. But look at yourself, mirror. Why you look at look at yourself, mirror? You wanted to you know make sure you look okay, and then you you know. But if you spit it on you yourself to this mirror, your face will be spit it. You're doing it to yourself, right? So that's, yeah. that is, a, to me, is a mentality I had, I have, you know, because I came from Japan. 
I mean, like, just imagine if those Japanese people and the American people swap the country, I will be believing in, the, in Japan will be in a chaos in a day. <laughs> it will be happening in a day. But he, if Japanese people came here and they're living in this huge country, they will be so quiet. I believe so. I believe so. I really yeah. believe. I mean, it's, it's just uh, here. But, you know, I love both countries. I love the, and I take the good part of each countries. Yeah, I I really love U.S. Yeah, they gave me the gave me the my you know whole life back something which is I never when I came when I came here in 1992 I never dreamed about living in this country married have a child have a career which is you know building in the business I honestly never dreamed never. No, no, no. I didn't come to this country to build my dream. No, I came here because I, I couldn't stand my country to how I was treated. So it, I, it choked me when I was there because I have a so much, you know, free spirit, and I couldn't stop, not to say anything. <laughs> so, and then. I didn't like to come here, but the moment I came here, I became shell because I did not know how to speak English. And then it was a big culture shock. I came from a tiny country and all of a sudden this like a huge, like a unbelievable, you know, like amount of the, you know, like a resource and like you know, like unlimited of the, you know, like a opportunities here. But I became like a dot. I really, I feel I really became a dot. So I never even thought. But somehow, I, I, I had a, I, I built my dream here without knowing. No, my dream was this. With, with, without knowing what your dream was. Without, no, yeah. no. But, but you've certainly found your voice again. I think you, you have, you found your no. voice. You found, you found your way to, uh, to, right. to be that. To be that uh, that American right. entrepreneur, which is which is fantastic. Yeah. Sensei Miwaka, how can people find you? What's the best way for them to make contact with you? If you, I have a website, and then yes, you can find me that way. But also, maybe if you can Google it, Sensei Miwaka Abacus, it should be shows up. That you know, oh. uh, Jack, yeah. It will be very easy to find Abacus Miwako. Or I think that will be the very easiest way. But yes, I have a website. It's called jamsportland.com. J-A-M-S Portland.com. Japanese Abacus Math School Poland. If you can oh, Google wonderful. it. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And what's your one piece of advice for a young person studying out? Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. This is something I learned myself. Uh, you know, uh, our age, learning the new things is harder. Young age, learning the new things is so easy. But the perseverance is the most harder things to all of us. That doesn't have to be young or old. But remember, I read recently the book said, if you learn anything, 10 hours, 10 hours, you will be mastered. So that means if you learn something 17 minutes per day for 365 days. So that means that 6,205 hours, I just calculated it in my head. Yeah. 6,205, <laughs> that means uh, almost... 10 hours. If you do it every day for 70 minutes, every day, you will master something, whatever you want it to be. So my advice to everybody, decide something to do, but don't give up. Don't give up. Weather, weather won't be you know, beautiful every day. Sometimes crowd, sometimes rain, sometimes hell. Life will be the same. It won't be joy every day. But there is always reason you have to cry. 
joy is a you know result of the you know like a sadness and then you know like a anger or everything so just keep going and don't give up that is my advice to everybody including Thank myself <laughs> <laughs> don't give up sensei mawako don't give up hey. no i'm not thank you thank you so much for traveling with me to the edges of the lean of lean this thank has been a wonderful conversation me. thank you for having me thank you this is bella engelbach and i'd like to thank sensei miwako for being my guest on the edges of lean what did you learn from this conversation what ideas did it spark for you we would love to hear from you find miwako at abacusonlineclasses.com Find me on LinkedIn or at leanforhumans.com or comment wherever you watch or listen. Subscribe and tell a friend about the Edges of Lean. Please join me in exploring more of the Edges of Lean. There's a lot to learn. And check out my friends at the Lean Communicators community at leancommunicators.com. You'll find more podcasts and videos with lots of great new content every week. The Edges of Lean is written and produced by Bella Engelberg with support from Podcast Inc. This is a Lean for Humans production.